Hi guys, thanks for coming. My name is Jonathan Knight. I'm Managing Director here at Board Intelligence. Um, and I'm going to keep this very short, but I, so it might be interesting for you guys to hear why we were interested in doing a tech meetup at all. Uh, and then just to set the context for Patrick's talk, which is all about the constraints that we've got. So um, I guess we're, we might be the SaaS company that you've never heard of. So we are um, quite, quite a fast growing company. We're going to hit 8 million recurring revenue this year. So we're not huge, but we're not tiny either. And we've got a team of 20 in our product and tech team. And it has taken a long time to find those 20 people and to get such great people in the company who can do projects like the one Patrick's going to talk about. Um, one thing we always said when we started our, our journey into software as a service about six, seven years ago was we wanted to be part of the community of people who build these kind of solutions. And that's one thing that we've actually not really managed to do because we've been so busy building it. So this is our first kind of step out into actually we've solved some really interesting problems and we want to share the way we've solved them with people. And then we want to hear back on how other people have solved similar or different problems. And then, of course, we'd also love you guys to know where we are so the next time you're looking, you know, you can find us. Um, so... Who are we? Uh, we? We make software for boards, so company boards, NHS trust boards, anywhere where you've got some senior decision makers coming together for their decision making meeting. Um, and uh, we hope, we believe we make their decision making more effective and our software provides uh, sort of the way of making that more effective. Now, I won't try and bore you with the details of how that works, but what I will explain is some of the constraints Patrick's about to talk about. So, Working with boards, uh, especially in regulated industries, there are still quite some constraints from the procurement teams in those industries and from the reg regulators in those industries as to what you can use. Um, so some of our companies will be fine if we use public cloud, but a lot of the clients we work with aren't fine or are not yet able to procure in that way. So for us, it makes a lot of sense to build on our own infrastructure so that we can say from end to end, we own this infrastructure, we know where the data is, we manage it, we handle the security, and you can audit us, and you don't have to rely on any other third parties, such as Amazon, AWS, etc. Now, obviously, everyone in this room knows that there are ways to make those services just as secure, but unfortunately, in the world we live in, the kind of procurement nightmare you get as soon as you open that door is too great. So we've had to overcome a lot of the same scaling challenges that other companies rely on public cloud for. We've had to do it in a very secure way, we've had to do it in a way that minimizes use of resources, because although we are growing fast, we're not that big yet. Um, and that's probably about all the intro you need, isn't it, Patrick? Working under some heavy constraints. So it's Patrick Sundberg who's, uh, who's built our, or, or designed and built most of the infrastructure for this. And there we go. Okay. Right. So uh, that, that sets the stage. And as, as John said, I'm Patrick Zuberg. Uh, I'm very much a generalist by background. I've done all sorts of programming from assembly language to high level stuff. I've done the infrastructure uh, on the premise, in the cloud, so forth. Um, lately, I've uh, done a lot of functional programming, so that's one of my personal interests. At Board Intelligence, though, I've mostly focused on the infrastructure and uh, <laughs> yeah, the infrastructure and, and, and architecture. Hello. Ah, let's try that. So, John has already really set the scene, but for the purpose of this talk, we deal with very important information that serves very senior people. That's kind of the the setting and. To that, we provide some web user interfaces, an iOS app, a Windows app, and backend APIs to serve those. BI-specific considerations, uh, doubling up a little bit of what, what Johnny went through. We, for good reasons, can't use public cloud resources. We have, obviously, strong security and data segregation um, constraints. We, we really do not want, under any circumstance, to, say, have a rogue user of an, one organization causing issues for, for another client, uh, especially when you deal with, with listed public companies uh, and, and board meeting notes and so forth. That, that starts to be really serious stuff. So, hence we operate a deployment per client model, i.e. we have a, a separate instance or instances dedicated to each of our clients, separate database, separate object store, and so forth. So everything runs in parallel. So at the moment, that means that we're sort of in the hundreds to thousands of deployments, which, which obviously, is, you know, any, anyone on the, on the infrastructure side probably feels like, oh, that's, that's, that's a bit annoying. <laughs> and then on top of that, as I said, we do not use public cloud resources, which then brings the question, how, how do we do that? And how do we do that without hiring an army of people? 
So, and, and I also add that we're trying to limit ourselves in our architecture for the moment to kind of deal with thousands of clients. And we're quite happy if we get to tens of thousands of clients that things need to be done differently and you know d different rules apply. So, so that's kind of setting the scene. We're, we're in the hundreds to thousands of parallel deployments. We want to manage it with, with a small team. How do we do it? Network setup we, is pretty, pretty simple and traditional. We, 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 we've got multiple data centers, private um, inter, inter data center links, separate uh, internet upstreams for, for each data center. We have a controlled plane uh, th through VPNs. And, and obviously the, the client traffic coming for, through, through the public internet. Physical in infrastructure, <laughs> multiple data centers, try to have redundant network equipment in each data center. We have private network links between each data center. We manage sort of in the, at the moment in the order of tens of service per data center, in, in the low tens, like 15-ish. Uh, that, that, that's our kind of our current thing. So. We don't need sort of a dedicated staff to, to just do hardware. It's, it's, it's fine. If something breaks, we don't need to fix it overnight sort of thing. We, we, you know, we, it, it's part of the redundancy. In terms of information flows of our system, we, as I said, with the, the part uh, called client portal here, uh, that, that's, that's the per client uh, uh, specific deployment I referred to earlier. We have a couple of shared services, which are more things like billing and so forth that are not dealing with, with any sensitive data. It's just uh, sort of operational stuff. Uh, some job queues, an event log, uh, per data, a per client database, and a per client object store. That, that sets this, you know, those are the sort of things we need to manage uh, within our system. Uh, our choices on the state side, we use Postgres, we use OpenStack Swift for file storage, blob storage, and we use Kafka for job queues and event logs. So that's, that's kind of, oh, oh, oh. the state is always important, most important in terms of how you, how you go about. <laughs> As I said, data segregation is a big thing for us, uh, and, and I alluded to that before, so we, we, we do, for, we, we see all of our data as, as secret as uh, important so forth. But we try to segregate the client generated data from sort of the metadata. So the board packs, the contents of, you know, FTSE 100 company X's actual user generated content is different from the metadata saying that, you know, there is a user of this company who, whose name is X. Uh, and, and for the, for, for the what, we, what we call the, um, the critical, uh, data we uh, we apply both uh, an encrypted at rest, uh, at rest <coughs> policy and also a per client encryption on top of that. While for the uh, for the sort of more metadata stuff, we we still encrypt it, but you know it's it's part of a of an encrypted hard drive. It's not it's not uh, seen as as sensitive to need to be then encrypted again on a per client basis. And we never allow the same critical data to exist in one component shared between different clients. That, that, those are kind of the constraints we set up ourselves in order to sleep well at night, in order to be able to tell our clients that, you know, if, if a rogue user does something for one of our clients, that has no impact on, on you. Uh, which uh, protecting yourself from your own valid clients is obviously always diffi more difficult than protecting yourself from the general internet, so, so to speak. Um, so how do we go from, from bare metal servers to, to running all these hundreds of deployments uh, in, in, our, in our setup? So we start off with very minimum setup of bare metal servers. Uh, you, we use Ansible to set up just enough to run Docker and Kubernetes and a couple of telemetry things uh, just to kind of monitor the service. So nothing particularly interested on that side except that we also use Ansible to configure our network equipment, which is something that probably we didn't realize until doing things a while that it's really, really annoying when your router goes down and you can't just you know, switch over and set it up easily. You, you know, if that part isn't automated, then uh, <laughs> it, it's almost the most important part of your whole data center, single point of failure kind of setup. So that, that, that's something that we learn over time that's, that's important. 
Secondly, once we have you know, a, a minimally set up uh, server with the uh, Docker and Kubernetes, we then try to set up our sort of highly available Kubernetes cluster on top of that, which is not super trivial. Um, you know, sometimes the internet uh, suggests that these things are easy and it's all smooth sailing. It's not really the case. But it has gotten a lot easier over time. So there are a few tools like Kube, Kube Adam, which, which is a, a formal tool, part, part of the Kubernetes stack these days, which, which is very useful for setting things up uh, in terms of each server. But it leaves a few really, really, really important things unsolved. And the most thing on that side for, uh, for, for us, or at least the hardest for us uh, to figure out how to solve was in order for anything to be highly available, you need a fixed point to bootstrap everything else from. And in this case, that's the Kube API. That's the component of Kubernetes that needs every other part of the cluster needs that to be available. How do you find that? Where is it? And everything comes from that. Under the wrappers, you know, it uses etcd and so forth, which has already sort of solved that problem. But every other piece needs this Kube API. So how, how do we accomplish that? And uh, normally people just say, well, that's easy. You just you know, get an AWS load balancer and you put it behind that and everything is easy or the equivalent of Google Cloud and so forth. But if you don't have that, if you don't have that magical load balancer component, how, how do you do it? Um, so the way we solved it, uh, from doing a bit of research into how the cloud guys do it, <laughs> is uh, through something called BGP, which is one of the internet routing protocols. And the way it basically works is that, th this is kind of a sketch of how our uh, three data centers, currently three data centers uh, set up. So we got a router per data center and then you know some servers connected. In each data center, there is a designated Kubernetes master. Uh, so we got, you know, as long as two out of three is, is all right, everything should be fine. So we can, uh, you know, uh, we, we're, we're operating within the constraint that if one data center is down, that's fine. We still operate. If two data centers are down, then we take downtown. So the way we managed to do things is that we set up a, an internal BGP routing uh, table. So routers obviously already speak BGP. That's kind of a, a native thing that most routers know how to do. So that basically just means that you, you configure the routers to speak to each other and they chat around and say things like, hey, behind me, you find these subnetworks, you know, A, B, C, D, and you know, there's one hop to get to them. And the other one says what's behind him and they all speak and between that, they all know what's behind all of those uh, all of those BGP peers. To that, we then add that the Kubernetes masters themselves also are BGP bears, peers. So they tell their upstream router that I've got this virtual IP address, you know, a fixed IP address that we use to bootstrap the Kube API from. And it says, if you want to get to this virtual IP address, you can go through me. So that goes to, you know, say from Kubernetes master one here, it goes to router one. Router one then tells his, his friends. So now everyone knows that this virtual IP X, you can go through by that router. The same thing happens from this and this. So once, if all three data centers are open, now every router knows that there's three potential routes to get to this virtual IP address X. And if any one of the servers goes down, the BGP is smart and quick to realize that it's down. It's got heartbeats and stuff like that. So the moment one of these servers goes down, all the other routers will quickly be told that, okay, now you can't reach this virtual IP address X through this route anymore. You need to take one of the two others. So that, that, that sort of takes care of finding that initial uh, bootstrap point from which everything else is then, uh, is, is then uh, built on top of. And you know, BGP has been used for much more complicated networks than this for a very, very long time. You know, it basically runs the internet. So, so it's, it, you know, it's, no, it's very proven technology. Uh, the routers themselves already, already know about it. And interestingly enough, the other servers don't need to know anything about this. The other servers here, they will just send their package up to their default gateway. And that router will then know Either you know, pick the closest one, which is uh, in, in its own data center. If that is down, it will then just forward on the packet to, to one of the other two potential targets for that, for that IP address. So 
you, you only need to configure the routers and the actual Kubernetes masters uh, service here. And, and everyone else just has their simple, there's no complicated routing or anything. They, they just have their upstream route and that's it. So, so that, 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 you know, that, that's a sort of problem which takes a while to research and to work out and to solve and so forth. But you know, once solved, um, hasn't, you know, it's, it's not really, there's no real maintenance per se and so forth. It's, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a stable, stable kind of solution um, using very old, very well-tested technologies. So that, 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 that's, that's one interesting problem that uh, has come up. So once we have our Kubernetes cluster, at the moment, we've taken the choice to not run stateful components inside of Kubernetes. Uh, the reason for that is that for that to really be useful, you need to be able to provision uh, disks to attach to any potential server and so forth. And in our experience at the moment, that's, that's not really a, well, in our opinion, it's not a solved enough problem yet. I mean, there are solutions out there for bare metal provision of, of, of dynamic disks and so forth. but uh, we, we don't really feel like it's uh, sort of battle tested enough at this stage. So we, we've taken out, we basically have Postgres, OpenStack Swift, and Kafka, and we run that uh, separately. We manage that through Ansible, but also it's noteworthy that those are not the parts of our architecture that we need to sort of really scale. Uh, you know, it's the per client deployments that, that really requires more sort of parallel deployment while the stateful components you know, we, we have one Postgres cluster, we have one database per client, but we don't have one database server per client. So, so hence, it's, it's perfectly, uh, for our use case, it's perfectly fine for this to not sort of be the all singing, all dancing, automatic failovers and so forth uh, solu solution. It's, and most of these, you know, OpenStack Swift and Kafka, they, they, they natively have failovers and so forth anyway. And in our setup, Postgres is the only component where we have chosen to have a manual failover where if, the, if, if our master database node go, goes down, we, we have a manual Ansible uh, switch over there. Uh, we, you know, we're aware there are aut automatic ways of doing this, but we, we've chosen to kind of take a short known downtime compared to the potential danger of getting data corruption in, in, in the case of a, of a bad uh, failover. So that's the stateful components. The, then running our own stuff. So, so now we've, you know, we've installed other people's software and now we want to actually run our software. And that, that means that you know, the per client deployments, the, some of the shared services like billing and so forth, uh, all, all that stuff. And remember, we also have you know, at the moment some 400-ish deployments. So if we're going to roll out a new release, we don't necessarily do it to all 400 at the same time. We need some way of saying, okay, take this subset of things and roll it out just a few, see how it goes, and then, you know, migrate people, uh, all, all the kind of stuff. And all, all of that is things that I'm, I'm sure most people in this room have come across, and they know that it can be difficult enough when you have one deployment. When you've got 400, uh, it, it, becomes, it becomes more intensive in terms of you, you need some, some good tooling. So the way we've solved this, we've um, created something we call permafrost, which is a service that we use to, as we say, manage everything else. So the way we think of it is, it's a bit of a sort of a more of a business domain layer on top of everything else. Like in the same way that Kubernetes have kubectl, AWS has AWS CLI, uh, and so forth. This is sort of permafrost. Is our uh, layer on top of our infrastructure where we can deal with dom business domain level information, i.e. things like, I want to create a new deployment for a new client. That involves a new client, uh, a new client deployment, it involves creating a new Postgres database, it involves creating a new Swift container, and so forth. Uh, also interacting with external uh, services to set up things like uh, external moni uptime monitoring, uh, log shipping, and you know, all, all that kind of stuff. So permafrost is our thing for that. So sort of in a diagram fashion, we, 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 we have at the moment, we only have a, a command line client. We have the IP API service. And then the API service then effectively manages you know, Kubernetes, Swift, Postgres, Kafka, external services, as I said, for uptime and so forth. Uh, and it also interacts with our, with our Git repos. And one, one of the good benefits of this is that 
permafrost, most of our users, developers, ops people, and anyone in the company don't really need to have access to anything but permafrost. And through permafrost, we then get a very uh, business level ability to set permissions, roles, groups, and so forth. So you you know the the support team might be able to have read only access to see, uh, for example, how many jobs is stuck in a queue or something like that. While some people like me can do most things uh, to to kind of maintain the system, while some developers might be able to do some uh, level of debugging of a live system, and we we sort of we can choose we can pick and choose how we define our permissions and our roles, which is much easier for us than to go and try to create for each potential use case all the combinations per user of Kubernetes permissions, Postgres permissions, Kafka permissions, so forth. It, it's, it's, it, it's, a, it's a lot of complication there. So we try to encapsulate all of our workflows from the support team to developers to ops people. Um, all, everyone tries to, you know, we're trying to get everyone basically on the on the same on the same tool, uh, and that means that the state of of this service is very important. That's kind of the the uh, the bootstrap, so to speak, at the business level where everything else comes from. And um, we we obviously want audit logs. We want to be able to roll back if we do something that we shouldn't have done. And the way we've done this is that we've created effectively just a a data structure that is easily serializable to, to disk that des describes what we want the running system to look like, you know, which clients exist, what deployments exist, all that, all that kind of stuff. And we then use a Git repo as our store for our state. And by doing that, we basically get a Git-like workflow for the whole API. So the way we interact with our system is things like, okay, create this new client, and or create this other client. Perhaps we have two clients that need to be created. We, we, we batch up whatever operations uh, fit together, and then we commit that. And that means that all of those changes get re reflected in the system uh, as, as kind of an, as an atomic unit, uh, all or nothing, effectively. And we get a perfect audit log about exactly what changed. Uh, you know, the, the Git repository will have the diff uh, in a way that we can go back and look at. It also means that have, we have easy rollback uh, if, we, if we need to, you know, we, we made a mistake and we want to go back to where we were before. Um, so so, so that, that's, been, that's been a very good, good idea. And, and on top of this, uh, we, we haven't sort of quite uh, continued down this path, but we have some novel ideas how we can have, even start to do things like requiring a, 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 a commit approval that, you know, I make the changes and I come, I, I, send them off for commit approval, and then a second person with the right permissions actually need to go and say, yes, this looks sensible, we should do that. We should be rolling over, you know, we should be failing over the Postgres master, uh, and that looks sensible, and they approve it. So you sort of have, a, have an internal checks and balances on that side. We're, we're not quite finished with that, but the workflow and the way we've chosen to store our state and the way we, we work with the state in a, in a, in a git -like workflow kind of a, a allows us to, uh, to, to introduce these kinds of things on top of which, which, which we think is pretty, pretty neat. <clears throat> then we move on to, okay, so now we have something that can deploy the stuff, and then how do we manage our stuff? And uh, we operate a, a monorepo, and we don't have a big separate team that is responsible for you know, ops and release management and this, that, and the other. We obviously have some segregation within the within the business for how we do this, but as we said, if the whole team is 20 people and we've got 400 deployments and so forth, we, we, we want to try to make as much as we can and make as many people in the company as knowledgeable about everything as they can be, for a, for a lack of a better description. And one way we've worked out how that is uh, achievable, which has other positive uh, follow-through as well, is to try to store the deployment info, the config, and so forth together with the actual software services. So that means that in our monorepo for service X, we will also have a Kubernetes customized template for how to deploy service X in, in deployment. And that's, so if you make a change, where, which for example, needs some new config to be set, some new environment variable, you're expected to commit the corresponding change to the customized templates at the same time so that you can test things. It also means that we're not quite there, but it means that the, the idea is to then also run the same exact uh, customized templates in dev 
so that you know that what you're developing against is actually the same type of deployment that is going to show up in, in production later on. One problem with this, which we struggled a bit to solve, is that that's all well and good, but if you do that, how do you put the actual prod config in a monorepo that is supposed to be accessible by all developers? All developers shouldn't have you know, access to secrets going into production. That, that's not good. And we found a, 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 a cute way of doing this, which is called sealed secrets. It's, um, it's a way where we effectively store um, highly encrypted data in our monorepo. So only a few people uh, can change these files, as in can, can, in can encrypt these files with the right keys and so forth. Uh, and what it means is that when we deploy something, the encrypted blob goes into Kubernetes, and then there's a service running inside of Kubernetes that takes that encrypted blob, decrypts it, and has then the config available in Kubernetes that is actually used to, for, for, for the various deployments. So, so this, this has been a good way for us to, to not sort of segregate the ops and deployment part from the actual services. It, it all goes together, and in the ideal kind of workflow, you make changes, you make changes to the customized template, you use the customized template in your local dev setup to see that everything works, and then if there is something that needs to be done in prod, you ask you know, the, the couple of people with the right permissions to, 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 to make the changes to the, to the prod that, that's needed. And, and that way we kind of we spread the, the load of maintaining all of this among the dev team and not just focused on sort of more of a segregated uh, depths or uh, ops or, or uh, release team. So, so that, that, that's, uh, that, that's quite, quite a, quite a, I haven't seen that used in, in, in many places and it's something that we like. One thing that I touch upon briefly, when you do operate bare metal, having a lab environment, which is as good of a replica of your physical setup as possible, is very useful. Uh, in the cloud, in a public cloud, that's very easy. You just spin up a replica of whatever your system is, but with bare metal, you don't easily spin up three data centers and so forth. So, so what we've basically done is built as the same network topology, but in, but in one rack. So if we have three, three physical data centers in reality, we segregate our rack into three parts. We have three routers in our rack. Instead of into data center links, we just cross-connect the routers in the, in the rack. That way we have a topology logically consistent setup. And with that, we can then go, you know, hell for leather and simulate every problem that we can, just pulling cables and, you know, destroying hard drives, all the kind of stuff that happens in production that, that otherwise is quite difficult to simulate in, uh, in, in a bare metal setup. setup. And before we had this, uh, it, it was definitely very difficult to kind of feel sure that you had really tested everything. It's not the same thing to close down a network connection in a, in a controlled fashion as you're janking the cable, that, which is more like what a power outage or something would, would cause. So, so that, that's something that is definitely important for us to uh, operating bare metal. Just to round out the uh, kind of description of the stack, our, our backend services today uh, is Ruby, Clojure, and Go. And on the front end, or on the user interface side, we, we, we've got some JavaScript, some Objective-C on the iOS side, and some C-sharp on the Windows side. We do use a few external services, um, and never for you know, critical data, sensitive data. This is things like you know, Datadog for some metrics and, and telemetry, status cake for just uptime checking. So basically things that you can't do in-house, which are non-sensitive data, we, 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 we try to manage. And, and as I mentioned, we also try to manage the setup and config and management of those services through our permafrost layer. So when you create a new deployment, you automatically get a status, uh, um, a status cake check to, for, for that client deployment and so forth. Uh, security, I'm just going to mention, I'm not going to go through this, but basically we try to segregate things as closely as we can. So each level of the stack that tends to be a way of locking things down. And you know, you start with the public internet, then you have some access to the control plane through, through a VPN, then through firewalls, you might have access to all of the control plane or, for example, only the permafrost API. Then in permafrost, you have all the permissions there. Under that is Kubernetes, under that is physical service, under that is kind of um, pseudo rights on physical service, under that is physical equipment and data center. So 
we, we kind of try to work through what are all the levels, what are the minimal setups that is required on all of that. And in the end, 95% of people only ever need access to permafrost. Uh, and everything below that is, is basically, you know, a couple of people uh, that, 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 that needs to be able to kind of poke at the, at the underlying stuff. Uh, and, and there are a few benefits to that. Apart from making the security segregation easier, it also means that fewer people being able to do anything in a kind of a freestyle, uh, you know, use your own judgment kind of manner means that there's less scope for doing anything incorrectly. And by forcing as much as possible to go into permafrost, it also means that we sort of have to pre-can uh, all, all the kind of workflows that we can that we can think of. So if we need to fail over the Postgres master database, that's something that gets encoded in permafrost, and then once it's done, it's done, and it's tested, and it's part of everything else. Uh, so, so, it, so it's been kind of a good... We, we, at first, I was probably thinking that it would be more... We would use the other levels more, but in practice, we worked out that actually the best way of doing permissions is at the business level domain. Uh, being able to create your own uh, permission that is database failover and assign that to Johnny is a lot better than saying that Johnny can have this firewall rule, this SSH access, this pseudo limits, this, you know, it becomes a whole list of stuff. But instead, you just have the one business domain level uh, concept and you can, can assign that to the right people or to the right group and Bob's your uncle. So future work, um, next up for us is a lot of telemetry. We, we, we have, you know, in terms of uh, metrics, both, both metrics from a, from a kind of a computer science uh, uh, infrastructure perspective, but also business level domain uh, metrics is, is something that, that, that we feel we can do a better job at. We have our last manual intervention, the, the Postgres failover, which we might uh, try a, a few versions of. A really interesting, which we might uh, try to attack at some point, is client-side encryption. So currently we do per-client encryption, but obviously we as Board Intelligence has uh, owns the encryption keys. Uh, for some of our clients, it would be really cool if we had no ownership of the encryption keys at all, and it all was owned by the by the client. Uh, so BI can't access any information uh, with you know without the client's uh, physical uh, approval. And uh, moving more things into permafrost, you know, more and more of the things, you know, we we we, we do still have a backlog of of, ans uh, of Ansible playbooks and 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 stuff, which bit by bit we're trying to move into into permafrost and. Uh, and be part of the, the, the kind of business domain uh, operational level. And I think that's all I was hoping to do. So thanks. And I'm not sure if we're doing some questions at the end, right? Cheers.